pack. Because uh, I'm an old Giants fan. Judge Lowry. And Dean Lowry played against Dan. My son. Hey, Vicky, how are you doing? All right. So I was rooting for the Packers because Dean, Dean Lowry uh, played against Dan in junior tackle. Uh, Dean would played for Nelson Storm. And Dan, just before he moved here, um, he played for Carlson. Then he played for Belvedere junior tackle. But they played against each other in junior tackle. Um, by the way, Dan's team beat Dean's team. <laughs> then... They played in high school when Dan played for the Bucks and Dean played uh, for Boylan. <laughs> and Dan told me that uh, Dean was, nobody had a motor like Dean. Dean had, he never took off a of play. He was the toughest and cleanest player he ever played against. And he was, I mean, he was a true gentleman and everything was great. So I was rooting for the Packers be, be, for, because of, of my personal connection. And I don't have this antipathy that Bears and Packers fans have for each other. But I did notice one thing that was interesting about the game last night. Um, who is the kicker? Uh, I know, this is just my way of... Robbie Gold. And uh, let me tell you a little history, because I'm up here early, and I know um, attendance is going to be way down today. But um, Robbie Gold... Does anybody know that Robbie Gold was the kicker last night for the 49ers? And Robbie Gold also was the kicker for the Bears, who let him go a little too early or they would have been the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. Okay, so Robbie Gold. Robbie Gold was a kicker. Anybody know where he played college ball? Penn State. And I was at a game when he was kicking for Penn State, and I was right on the sideline. And Robbie Gold was playing the Pitt Panthers. And they were down by two points. And Robbie Gold was going to go in to kick. And he was about there warming up. And because I was trying to be encouraging, I went like this. Shank. Shank. Because I, I wanted him to miss. I wanted him to miss. And he, I'll never forget, Robbie Gold smiled at me. And then he kicked it right through <laughs> and beat Pitt, and it was great. But so Robbie Gold, there's a lot of there. But there was some kind of poetry there last night, no matter who you were for, that Robbie Gold ends up uh, kicking that uh, thing. Um, I have a little, <clears throat> my wife gets upset when I say this, um, but I have a little uh, cough today. But I want to assure you that I don't have COVID. It's just cancer, you know. So it's no problem. You know what I mean? Now, people who understand the humor that I've just given, how many understand what I'm saying by doing that? Yeah. You know, it's just a joke that I'm trying to make. So you tell everybody that throughout the neighborhood, by the way, can you imagine what's going to go out through uh, some of the areas tomorrow? Pastor Cop has cancer. That's what's going to be saying. You know, uh, thank God he doesn't have COVID. <laughs> it's amazing. Just amazing. Bad humor. <clears throat> How many of you uh, ever heard of a group called the, um, I'm not going to sing anything by them, but the Boys, B-U-O-Y-S. Anyone ever hear of the Boys? As a rock group, back in the late 60s, and they were from northeastern Pennsylvania, and they had a song called Timothy. Anyone remember the song Timothy? Timothy, Timothy, where on earth did you go? Anybody remember that? Oh, man, it's like talking to Karen McClinton about the Rolling Stones. Um. <laughs> anyway, the reason I'm thinking about Timothy is because we're going to talk about Timothy starting today. <clears throat> it only takes a spark to get a fire going. Soon all those around can warm up to its glowing. 
That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced him, you spread his love to everyone you want to pass him on. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I found. I think I'm going to sing that again, because isn't that really where we're coming from as Christians, as we look to all the unhappy, miserable people around us? I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I've found. You can depend on God. It matters not where you're bound. I'll shout it from the mountaintop. I want the world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass God on. Sing it with me. I wish for you, my friend, this happiness that I found. You can depend on him. It matters not where you're bound. I'll shout it from the mountaintop. I want the world to know the Lord of love has come to me. I want to pass God on. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. Before you were born, God knew you, and, and, and then God made you. He knit you together in your mother's womb. And God loves you very much, so he sent his son, his substance, Jesus, to save you. And now God wants you to be his. Blessings on you. God bless America. Welcome to our family of faith here on the corner of Lincoln and Maine, where Jesus is Lord. You're welcomed, included, and loved. Anyone want to be happy? Raise your hand. How happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or joins a group of gossips or mockers. Instead, a happy man finds his delight in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on the Lord's instruction day and night. And so, He's like a tree planted beside streams of water that bears its fruits in its season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not like this. No, they're like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not survive the judgment of God. Sinners 
will not be in the community of the righteous. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked will perish. Psalm 1. Please pray with me. O oh God, in the midst of the meanness, madness, misery, and miscreants of life in the modern world, living in a nation of apostates in government, education, entertainment, news, even churches, all of them showing a hypocrisy with glaring shamelessness as they insult your holiness as exemplified in Jesus, explained in Holy Scripture. O oh God, we thank you for this oasis where we praise and we thank you for the faithful remnant where we can thank you for women and men of faith, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles who have kept their baptismal promises, not only marking off their children for you in religious ceremony, but also confirming that noble and faithful intention by insisting that their children be in worship. Insisting that their, their children be in Sunday school. Insist that their children be in programs like those led by the Karens and Donna on Wednesday. Insisting that we keep our congregational pre uh, pledge to the baptized as we scour the earth until we find a Pied Piper youth leader. Oh God, we thank you for the remnant, the baptized, the, and, and we not only mark off adults that have reached that discretionary and wise stage to receive you publicly in sacrament as Lord and Savior with the Paul, Apostle Paul. Hey, I love to talk about Jesus. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I love to talk about Jesus. He is the power of God for salvation. Anyone who has faith, and, and we do that, we dip them, drip them, dab them, dunk them. But what we really do, oh God, is when they give their faith to you, when they pledge their devotion to you, they are D-Y-E-D. -E they are dyed. They change colors. They change allegiances. And it's so good to be with them. They have a relief and eternal life. And we thank you, oh God, that you've given us the privilege to remind the baptized that belief is confirmed by behavior. And belief is confirmed and punctuated by worship and service. Sacrifice, grace, mercy, and forgiveness wrapped in agape. We thank you, God. We thank you, Father God, for inspiring the faithful remnant to be faithful despite the godlessness of our executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. We thank you for the faithful remnant in the world, and because we live in America, we talk about that most, pray about that most. We thank you for the faithful remnant in America that counters the useful idiots, enabling that apostasy, distancing people from you and distance of the truth from Genesis to Revelation. Return to me, says the Lord, and I'll restore your nation. I'll restore your families and marriages, schools and churches, if so, so, if not, not. So we thank you, O Lord, for the faithful remnant that reminds a nation of you. Thank you, Father God, that your promise to Abraham persists. That if the remnant remains faithful and prophetically speaks on your behalf in all things at all times and all places with all people, not just the safety of this sanctuary, but on the job and at play in the bowling alley, on the golf course, that if the faithful remnant reminds people of you, reminds the nation along with the globe that you alone are sovereign savior, sustainer, then there's hope. Then there is hope. There is hope for our nation that has lost your way. There is hope for our schools and churches that have lost your way. There's hope for our families and all of the rest that have lost your way. There is hope. Things can get better. Things can recover. Things can be restored. Things can be redeemed. And you have shown us how to do that. Just returning to you because you want 
everyone to be saved. That's what you said in Jesus. And that's why we're here today in worship. And that's why we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand up and sing our opening hymn, number 710. Jesus, lover of my soul, 710. heard of the boys b-u-o-y-s timothy timothy where on earth did you go tim it's a great story actually it's kind of a gross story but um that's from where i grew up that was a rock group back in the 60s along with a group called eighth street bridge um, the ravens joe nardone and the all-stars and a group that i was in called sound barrier and um we were really awful. Um, anyway, I hope uh, for your sake, I hope for your sake that you've heard what I've said before about a terribly sinful thing in my life. Uh, here it is. Uh, if I had spent more time in the Bible than in books about the Bible, I would have been a better man. 
and I would have been a better husband. And I apologize to my wife. I would have been a better father and son, a brother, uncle, friend, pastor, and presbyter. And because I love you, and because I love you more than I need to be liked by you, because I, I love you, and because I would literally die for you, I would never throw you under the bus. I would never throw you under the bus to get ahead. I've had pastors who have worked for me in the past, actually worked for him, but you know what I mean, worked for me, for him. I've had pastors in the past, church staff members and elders who would throw me under the bus to get ahead. But I would never throw you under the bus for my advantage. That's why I tell you about my greatest sin because I don't want you to make the same mistake. David was right in Psalms 1 and 119. I was wrong for not incorporating that wisdom into my daily schedule for too many years. How happy is the man? You all want to be happy? Here it is. Psalm number 1. If you want to be happy, raise your hand. How many of you really want to be happy? Here, here's the answer. I saw some of you didn't raise your hand, so I assume you don't want to be happy. This is real, friends. How happy is the man whose delight is in the Lord's instruction? How happy is the man who meditates on the Lord's instruction all day and all night. And the Hebrew here is very clear. And that is to meditate is to wrap yourself around it. How happy is the man who wraps himself around the word. Around the word and flesh and Jesus explained in Holy Scripture. Your word. Psalm 119. Your word is, is a light to my feet, a light to my path. It is a lamp to my feet. Back to Psalm 1. When I wrap yourself, when I wrap myself around your word, O oh God, I am like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. I am stable, and I am strong, and I am happy because I wrap myself around Jesus. Because I wrap myself around the Word. And back to 119, so I am resolved, the faithful say with David, in a really good New Year's resolution, several weeks late, but better than never. So I am resolved, O God, to obey your statutes to the very end, not the mandates of godless politicians. So it's true. I'm just scratching the surface of my relationship with Jesus by the book, as enlightened by the Holy Spirit, who never contradicts Jesus by the book. But don't get me wrong, I'm scratching. I'm scratching. I'm scratching more than ever before since my time with Eugene Peterson in October 2011. I will never forget that morning on the shore of Flathead Lake behind Jan and Eugene's house, the shore of Flathead Lake in Montana, when I opened to Matthew chapter 23. I'd read it a lot but I had missed it because my eyes were not focused on Jesus. I was not riveted to Jesus. I was like people in churches that just go through the motions. 
And I found out that Jesus didn't like a lot of clergy. I found out that Jesus didn't like the hypocrisy of clergy. And I read in Matthew 23, open it up sometime, that Jesus didn't like all the fancy vestments and robes. And I found out that Jesus didn't like the folks who needed to have special seats to show their humility. Touch of sarcasm. And that Jesus did not like the sense of entitlement of the clergy. And so and after I read that, I came back, some of you will recall, and I took down the tributes to my ego and idolatry in my study. I got rid of 99% of my library. That was hard to do because I had a really big library in 1982, it was insured for $55,000. And I at least doubled it by the time I got here. And I really liked my library because people would come into my study and they'd say, wow, you must be really smart. And then I got rid of my robes. I got rid of my collars. And all that other stuff that Jesus in Matthew 23, by inference called caca, dung. And I sent him off to two seminaries. I did keep one robe. I, I thought I kept two, but I, I checked between services. I only kept one robe. I kept a couple of collars because when I do weddings, they take pictures. But I got rid of 99 percent plus of my library I'd already read the books and I was only just keeping them there just to make people uh, just to impress them and besides that I didn't want to be distracted anymore now I want you to know that I do read other things I read other things besides the Bible I want you to know that I read other things to keep me informed about what's going on in our failing and falling nation and, and world. And there are some things that I read other than the Bible that actually increase my intimacy with God. To stay informed, and especially in these days when our government lies to us about almost everything with Fauci, sorry to disturb your idolatry, with Fauci as the poster boy of deceit, Deception, inconsistency, and darkness. <laughs> Feed me, Seymour. Well, I look for intersecting truth to stay informed by reading news sources from left, right, up, down, all around. And when they all agree, intersecting, I found truth. And when they don't, I keep searching. And let me admit that I really have to hold my nose and I have a barf bag close by when it comes to MSNBC, CNN, Don, Joy Black or White, Rachel, and the like. Liar, liar, pants on fire. When, when it comes to resources, when it comes to resources to help me move into deeper intimacy with our Lord, I have to confess to you that I am not into the prissy. I'm not into the feminine. I am not into the sissy or sentimental or syrupy or self-indulgent. But no, I'm into the devotional classics that I've read over and over and over and keep reading and keep going deeper into them. And with, they have fresh new meaning for me every day, like the imitation of Christ my utmost for his highest, and anything from the Egyptian hermits of the 4th and 5th centuries known as the Desert Fathers. But I'm all, always careful to time myself. Whenever I read other books, I time myself literally to see if I'm spending more time in the book or books about the book. 
Because only the book is divine. Only the book is canonical. The unparalleled, divinely inspired, God-breathed revelation of God. Quote from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God, God breathed, and all scripture, all, all scripture is profitable for teaching and for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And then, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. First of all, you should know this. No prophecy of Scripture ever came from one's interpretation. You ever hear anybody say, it doesn't matter, everybody's got a different interpretation for that Scripture? Wrong! You just don't get what God said. God is not double-minded. You are. God's not. You should know this. First of all, said Peter, No prophecy of Scripture came from one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. I mean, it's almost academic. Why spend time in secondary sources? How many of you ever went to high school and had to write a a thesis paper? Anybody ever go? Oh. See, you still got people here. I am not participating today in any way. I will not raise my hand. (laughs) Oh, man, you folks. Oh, gosh, help us. Okay, so how many of you went? Okay, how many went to high school and never had to write a thesis paper? And those of you who did any kind of education, you had to write something where you know the difference between secondary sources and primary sources. If you know the difference between secondary sources and primary sources, raise your hand. Okay. Okay, why spend your time on secondary sources? Anybody catching where I'm going here? Reading books about the book when you have the primary source of revelation right here. The book. (laughs) Or as Tucker Roth said many years ago in a confirmation class in Kansas City when I asked I said, what's it like to read the Bible? And he said, when I read the Bible, it's like I'm reading a personal love letter from God to me. I mean, really. How many of you can remember when you were really hot for your husband or wife? I mean, you you remember when you were dating You know what I mean? Courting. Come on. I mean, we're honest here, right? Dishonesty is out there. So come on. Nod. How many of you remember those days? Okay. Didn't you prefer to hear from she or he how she or he really felt about you? Am I right? You wanted it what? You didn't want it over Zoom meeting, did you? I mean, it was not like you're in eighth grade. Do you like me? Yes, no, maybe. (laughs) Hey, we've all been there, right? We've all been there. No, you want it face to face. Am I getting through to you yet? You get the point? The book. Read the book. Get it from God's mouth. Anyway, I read those daily devotionals. Um, There's also another one that I read pretty regularly, actually almost daily. Um, Our Daily Bread. How many of you are familiar with that one? Yeah, Our Daily Bread. You know why I read that every day? Because they're all through the church here, and I know people are reading it every day. So I want to know what you're reading so I can have an idea of what's going on around here. Unlike today's denominations and other religious 
pyramid schemes that often say things that horrify the faithful in their contradictions to Jesus by Holy Scripture. The connection between Jesus and some churches and pastors is purely coincidental. I like our daily bread. Um, the authors of those daily devotions in that little incy beansy teeny weeny quarterly pamphlet, they're faithful. Even if they're a tad syrupy, sensational, sentimental, superficial, on occasion. And as I said to someone that once objected to me being honest about it, my criticism, because she said to me, well, I read that every day. And I said, well, if that's all you're doing in your daily devotion to God, it's better than nothing. Better to, than nothing is next to nothing. Read the book. Read the book. It's God's personal love letter. God, our real pen pal. Why would you spend more time reading what someone has to say about what God says when you can just read what God says. And again, catching the drift here? Y'all catching the drift here? Anyway, I really like the January 3rd entry in our daily bread. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> again, it's not COVID, it's just cancer. Um, I really like the January 3rd entry in our daily bread by James Banks. Quote, whenever my grandfather took me to the beach, he always took off his watch and put it away. And one day I asked him why. And he smiled at me and replied, because I want you to know how important my moments are with you to me. I just, I just want to be with you and let time go by. And the author concluded, God always makes time for us. He says, I love you so much, I just want to be with you forever and let time go by. He loves us to death. He did. Everything God has ever done has been to draw us closer to him. To borrow a line from a book that we read every Mother's Day around here, God says, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby will be. God loves us forever. God likes us for always. As long as he's living, get it? As long as he's living, his babies will be. Everything God has ever done has been to draw us closer to him. Jesus, Emmanuel, enfleshment, incarnation, God with skin on, Holy Scripture, Holy Spirit to encourage us and to equip us to explain his love in Jesus by the book. He wants the best for us, and when we finally get that, when we finally get God, we have to admit for all matters of faith, morality, life, death, and eternity, Father knows best. God is our ultimate mentor as well as our master. For all matters from here to eternity. And we have a responsibility. Some of it, call, some of it would say it's keeping our baptismal promises to children... We have a responsibility by nurturing our children in the faith and keeping our baptismal promises. And then we keep our baptismal promises to our baptized adults by discipling them or teaching them how to think, how to speak, and how to act by the example of Jesus. An explanation of Holy Scripture. 
That's what happens when we baptize them. You know, some of the churches make too big a deal about this because they, they, they talk about the age. Come on, you just grow up, read, find out what this is about. To baptize a baby means to mark the kid off for God. And you're going to do everything you can to point the person to God. That's all it means. It means to mark them off. Just, it, they're going to have to make their own decision sooner or later. And when we baptize them as adults, they're saying, oh, wow, I do believe in Jesus. And then it's our responsibility, whether we dip them, drip them, dab them, or dunk them, that we help them change colors, change allegiances to God by the book. We are counter culture. We don't fit in anymore, do we? We don't fit in. And we don't want to fit in. That's what Paul's two letters to Timothy are all about. The old guy. The old guy with a lot of years already in. Thank you, Peter. The old guy with a lot of years already in. Mentoring the young guy who's new to the job. The vet Training the rookie. Rogers training. <laughs> <Forget that. laughs> Paul's two letters to Timothy teach us how to follow Jesus in life and ministry. And these two letters have become the standard operating procedure, the manual for ministry for pastors, elders, deacons, parents, Anybody wanting to esteem and enthrone Jesus. Now, we're going to find that there's a lot of overlapping and repetition in these letters. Honey bear, Paul is a repeater. Just want you to know that. Paul is a repeater. Because if it's worth saying once, it's worth saying twice. And if it's not worth saying twice, it's not worth saying once. So there's going to be some overlapping here. But primarily, the first letter is a primer for pastoral care. And the second letter is mostly about watching out for those wolves in sheep's clothing that Jesus talked about in Matthew 7. By the way, you notice, for the last two and a half years, we've talked a lot about wolves. You know why we talk about a lot about wolves? Because God did. God warns us about the wolves. The enemy I see wears a cloak of decency. Vestments. Office. Hmm. Over the next several weeks, we're going to look at how Paul prepares Timothy to be a pastor within the context of preparing people for the return of Jesus by reminding Timothy of how to really care for God's people. This is what Paul's doing. This, my young friend Timothy, this is how you really care for people. And he's going to insist on sound doctrine. He is going to teach the church that the church respects no one but God, first, foremost, and always. And Paul is going to establish guidelines for people who are called into church leadership. Today, our message introduces us to the recipient of these letters, a young rookie, wet behind the ears, greeny, young pastor, fresh out of seminary, going to his first church, Timothy. Our Bible lesson today, the harmonizing salutation from 1st and 2nd Timothy. Paul, this is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, an apostle of Christ Jesus for the promise of, 
of life in Jesus according to the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus who is our hope. And this letter is to Timothy who is my true child in the faith. Grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading of his word. Thanks be to Christ for the gospel. Please pray with me. Father God, in Savior Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, oh God, I was walking um, earlier in the week and I remembered a very mean man named John who hated me in a Christian kind of way. And I remember, even though it happened long ago or shortly after being ordained, but I've never forgotten that conversation. And... And I now understand how his meanness shaped so much of my understanding of being a a pastor, an officer, a church employee, or member. Lord, apart from the course on original sin, I've never understood emotionally how people in churches can be so mean and nasty to each other. I, 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 can't, I just can't wrap myself around that emotionally, even though I understand the Course on Original Sin. I don't understand how people are so vicious and pretend intimacy with you while hating other people. But I remember John, and he taught me that people were going to hate me, and, and I don't even remember why he hated me. But I remember him saying to me, Preachers come and go, and we stay. And you'll be gone before long, and then we'll look for the pastor that we wanted before you came. And I know it's true. I have no delusions. I've been around a long time. I know where the snakes are. I know everything. I just know it. And I know that if I die before this... If I die after this sermon today, oh God, there'll be ham and coleslaw and fellowship hall on Wednesday... And then there's going to be people lining up next Sunday to be on the pastor search committee so they can get the pastor that they wanted before I came. I have no delusions. I have no delusions about my place in anybody's life. And I know that there are people who want me to fade off into the sunset. I know that there are people that wish I did have terminal cancer. I know that there are people who don't want me around because I get in the way of their idolatries. And what they really want, as Dylan sang, is just an errand boy for their wandering desires. And while I thank you for the authentic, Jesus-loving, Bible-believing people in the church that encourage me, especially the coalescing of the remnant and the reinforced remnant, I know it's an increasingly decreasing remnant in all American churches, regardless of flavor or franchise. And that was clear to me on Friday, meeting with so many pastors going through the same thing. Where have the children gone? Where have the baptismal promises gone? Where's the attend? Anyway, oh God, while John meant to hurt me by what he said, you used it. You used it to remind me of a valuable lesson repeated over and over and over in the Bible with Paul explaining our interdependence and dependence upon you. We belong to each other and each needs all the others with the qualifier from the first beatitude being only the totally dependent upon you live happily ever after. And that's why I'm happy. And since then I I have felt privileged not entitled, privileged to preach. And I have understood it is your plan that everyone but you can be replaced in the pulpit or pew. Pastor, officer, CE director, choir master, organist, drummer, singing nun, custodian, youth leader, secretary, especially me. It is your design that everyone can be replaced but you. And now I understand why churches die. Churches die when they focus and rely on people more than you. 
Oh God, when I talk to people in dying churches, I hear lots about everyone, everything, but you in Jesus by the book. And that's why they die. That's why America's dying. So Lord, I want to thank you for that mean old man, John, because you used him to sober me about my role in the advancement of your kingdom. I'm totally dependent upon you, oh God, in interdependence with the faithful women and men to esteem you, enthrone you, enable intimacy with you for existential relief and eternal life in heaven by grace through faith in Jesus. So I ask you again, as I always do, speak in spite of me as I ask you to take the sin-inclined life of mine redeemed only by grace through faith in Jesus and work a miracle so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is my prayer, O God, as I preach today. May what happens next be for the glory, laud, and honor of Jesus alone, in whose name I pray, amen. The letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy, are from Paul, quote, an apostle of Jesus by the command of God, for the promise of life by grace through faith in Jesus. Essentially, this is the same greeting at the salutation of both letters. Paul is an apostolos. He is a messenger. Listen carefully. He is a messenger with one focus. Not a denomination. Not a political party. He is a messenger with one focus. Thus, ask who that may be. Christ Jesus, it is he. He has one focus, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. And he is an ambassador that always relays the good news of existential relief and eternal life by grace through faith in Jesus for anyone who receives Jesus as Lord and Savior. He is commanded. He is commanded to concentrate on Jesus. He is commanded to communicate who Jesus is and what Jesus can do for anyone here and now and hereafter. He is, quote, an apostolos by the command of God for the promise of life here and now and forever by grace through faith in Jesus. The letters are to Timothy, who is described this way by Paul. He is my, quote, true son in the faith, my dearly loved child. And the purpose of the letters is summarized in 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. I write these things to you so that you will know how people ought to act in God's church. I write these things to you so that you will know how people ought to behave. In the church. You see, Paul is the professor and Timothy is the student. Now, indulge this parenthesis, distinguishing Paul the professor to the professors who are polluting too many of today's churches, colleges, universities, seminaries, and so on. Paul doesn't think he's smarter than God. You ever hear, have a preacher get up? I know that's what Jesus and the Bible say, but I think. Or they blatantly will say, well, this is what it says here, but, you know, <laughs> you know, we don't have to really go with this stuff. No, no, no. Paul was different. He was a professional plagiarist. The best of what he had was not his own. It came from God through him for us. And that's what distinguishes him from a godly professor to the kind of professors that are polluting our churches, colleges, seminaries, and so on. He attended to the word. He did not contend with the word. And Paul is going to teach Timothy how to be a faithful pastor. I prefer to say he's going to teach him how to be a faithful under-shepherd to the good shepherd. 
And while we'll look at Psalm 23, Matthew 10, John 10 provide more context, essentially, summarily, Paul is going to advise Timothy on how to guide, provide, and protect the people who have been entrusted to him. So Paul is encouraging and guiding the development of Timothy as a pastor. He's passing on to the rookie what he has learned over the years on how to be an effective pastor or elder or deacon, teacher, um, leader, parent, congregant, charged to lead people into a closer relationship with God, punctuated by loyalty to God. Loyalty to God by creed and deed, confession, conduct, walk, and talk. He is loyal to God. Whenever I talk to people, almost any kind of vocation, but especially in the church, I say to them, assuming they love Jesus, assuming they know how to do the job, here is the three most important qualifications for employment in the church. Number one, loyalty. Number two, loyalty. Number three, loyalty. Staff members do not throw other staff members under the bus, and the senior pastor does not throw anybody under the bus. Loyalty. As such, these letters to Timothy have become the standard operating procedure or a manual of operations for church leadership and family leadership, community leadership, national leadership on how to guide, provide, and protect people. Indeed, if you have ever attended the ordination or installation of a pastor or church officer, more often than not, They've read something from these two letters. Eugene Peterson explains, in these two letters, Paul is encouraging and guiding the development of faithful church leadership. What he has learned so thoroughly for himself, he is now passing on to the young pastor, showing how to develop a similar leadership in local congregations and this is essential reading because ill-directed, listen carefully, ill-directed and badly formed spiritual leadership causes damage in churches. In these letters, Paul is showing Timothy how to do it right. It is painful to look at churches in America today. It is painfully obvious as we lament the increasing apostasy or distancing from God and Jesus by the book in so many of today's class choice churches that all of their problems, all of their problems, let me repeat, let me be a repeater here, all of our problems, all of anybody's problems, all the problems in the church can be traced back to pulpiteers and pew sitters and church boards and denominational bureaucrats that no longer act like Jesus is Lord by the book. And it's time that we stop making excuses for apostate, unfaithful churches that say such abominable things in their churches so contrary to this revelation. Let's admit, let's be honest, they don't really believe in Jesus. Because the Jesus they believe is not confirmed by, in this book. Simply churches and families and schools and nations and everything and everybody else lose his way when Jesus is no longer the answer to every question, no longer the answer to every challenge. To remit a popular phrase with an accent on fidelity, Paul is writing to Timothy and us not to suggest a different way to do church. Woo! No! He's saying, I'm going to show you a faithful way to do church. Not a different way, because that usually appeals to your loins and lusts, 
and lies and rationalizations and excuses as plastoys posers pretending fidelity with a religion about Jesus that is more coincidental than credible to Jesus. A few more preliminary notes before we dive into these letters over the next few hours now. No, no. Next, in the next couple of weeks. A few more preliminary notes. People come to Jesus in different ways. Amen? People come to Jesus in different ways. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, now there are different gifts, same spirit, different ministries, same Lord. There are different ways to honor God, but the same God activates each gift in each person. In other words, as long as Jesus is Lord by the book, as long as the substant, substance and content are consistent with Jesus by the book, as long as people are governed by Jesus by the book, as long as people have their focus on Jesus to honor him, esteem him, enthrone him, then those different ways are all legitimate. For example, remember Paul had the Damascus Road experience? Remember that? He was struck down by the bright lights of a Mack truck on Route 90, or something like that. I mean, it was dramatic. You know, forgive me for that one. But the, there, it was a dramatic conversion. And it is the classic of what we now say, a Damascus Road experience where God himself in Jesus as spirit, I don't know how it happened, but they were there and he was changed immediately and forever. You can read about that in Acts chapter 8, 9 and so on. And we talked a lot about that at the beginning of our just completed series on Philippians. Now here, now here, Timothy is much different. Timothy, who probably sealed the deal in confirming his faith during probably Paul's first missionary journey. You can read about that in Acts chapter 14. Timothy did not have a dramatic Damascus Road conversion. Timothy was nurtured in the faith by his mom. Lynn? Corey. Right? So he, he was nurtured in the faith by his mom and his grandma. Um, and they kept their promise to God when they marked off Timothy for God, baptizo. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Paul recalls Timothy's, quote, sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois and then your mother Eunice, and now I see it in you. Is that great or what? You got what you got from your mama and your grandmama. And I see it in you. They passed it on. It's been said Christianity is always one generation away from extinction. It is the responsibility of moms and dads and grandparents and uncles and aunts to pass it on. It only takes a spark. You know, by the way, I think these things are true. We don't, to pass it on. That's our responsibility, to pass it on. Not for institution or survival. This is all going to be dust in the wind sometime. What a shock to people with brass plaques. But that's going to happen. This is not about institutional survival. This is about the salvation of souls from one generation to the next. Let me ask you, are you passing it on, by the way? You pass it on to your family? Hmm. hmm. Okay, let's go on. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. But as for you, but as for you, it's, that's you and Timothy. Continue in what you've learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, your mama, your grandma, and you know that from childhood, because of your mama and grandma, that you have known the Holy Scriptures and you have wisdom 
for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of famed shrink, Carl Menninger, who was once asked by a young mom when she should teach values to her daughter. And Menninger asked the age of the child. And when the mom said the daughter was three years old, Menninger said, hurry home as fast as you can. You're already three years late. Interesting that Timothy's daddy is not mentioned by Paul in either of these letters. Now, this is going to hurt some of you, people like me. I'm going to be like you, Dad. <laughs> Interesting. Timothy's daddy is not mentioned in either of these letters. Um, he is mentioned in Acts chapter 16, verse 1. I love this. Quote, Timothy was the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. It's a put down. Timothy was the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. And it's a put down, kind of like saying his mom was a Cubs fan, but dad rooted for the White Sox. It was good, sorry. The point is, Timothy's dad isn't remembered. Timothy's dad is not revered in an Exodus chapter 20, verse 12 kind of way. Honor your father and your mother. And the reason Timothy's dad was not mentioned is because he wasn't a believer. And therefore, he did not do the manly thing. He did not do the strong, manly thing. He did not do the godly thing. And make Jesus the head of his life so that he could be the head of the family. And lead them all into a closer relationship with Jesus and ultimately to salvation. Never... Forget this. And this is an important preface to understanding a big part of what our Lord teaches us here through the Holy Scripture. To keep order in the house, there must be order in the house. Do you hear that? Look at what is happening to America. There's no order in the house. Let's all vote. <laughs> you know, i got to tell you what. Oh, I didn't force my kid to go to Sunday school. I didn't force my kid to go to worship, you know, because he didn't want to. Oh, good for you. Who's the adult in your family? Oh, oh. To keep order in the house, there must be order in the house. There must be order in the house. And here it is. This is the biblical model. If you don't like this, this is your problem. God has told you how to make your family work. God has told you how to make your nation work. If you don't like, don't bother me. Just admit that you are a sinner. You are disobedient. Here it is. This is order in the house, order in the nation. The man is the head of the house if Jesus is that man's Lord and Savior. And if that's true, the wife will be loved and esteemed and cared for. And the children won't get away with... There will be order in the house. And the reason there's so much disorder in America's homes is because there's no order in the house. Conversely, if Jesus is not a man's Lord and Savior, that man has no right to claim leadership in the house. If Jesus is not the head of a man's life, he has no right. He forfeits his right to be head of the house. 
And a man like that ends up like Timothy's daddy. Timothy's daddy is an afterthought. Timothy's daddy is considered irrelevant by God. Useless. Read those letters to Revelation. If you're not shining for Jesus, you're worthless. And so Timothy's dad becomes the model of many American dads. An afterthought, quote, Timothy was the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a geek, Greek. I didn't make a mistake, I know what I was saying. Mom was saved, praise God. Grandma was saved, praise God. Dad was not, and fortunately, Mama and Grandmama were saved, and they teamed up to overcome the damning influence of an unsaved man in the house. And so, from a good start at home, Mama, Mama Eunice, Grandmama, Lois, and then going to seminary with Professor Paul, Timothy became a true son in the faith. He became the apostle's protege. He helped to write 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. He accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys. He represented the apostle when Paul was not available, and he became the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And so it was his call to be a pastor to the Ephesian church that prompted the apostle Paul to write these two letters. My guess, my guess is Timothy always kept these letters close by. Just as churches have done ever since. Amen. As Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, I take these elements of bread and fruit of the vine to be separated from all common use to this holy use and mystery. And as Jesus blessed and gave thanks, let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for choosing us. Help us to choose you in all things. The influences of the world cause us to be weary. Help us to follow you alone. Help us to know the difference between the evil forces and your divine goodness. Grant us wisdom. Help us to listen to your voice and not the clanging cymbals of how we grew up. Forgive our ignorance. We really do want to please you. That means that we won't please others. So give us the strength to belong only to you. And thank you for Jesus, who taught us to pray together, our Father. According to the holy institution of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in remembrance of him, we do this. From the same night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took <coughs> excuse me, bread, and after he had blessed and given thanks, he broke it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. I've broken my body for you. Remember me. 
After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink of it in remembrance of me for the forgiveness of our sins. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do show the Lord's love for us here, now, and forever. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, and your mercy is upon us. Father, every one of us is so thankful today because we get it. No one is pure and perfect in every way. And we've all made mistakes, sins. We've insulted your holiness. We've injured people around us. And you tell us that as we confess those sins, as we turn to you and beg to get better by the assist of your Holy Spirit, you forgive us, you cleanse us, past, present, and future, and you allow us to start all over again, and we don't have to remember who we were because that's not who we are anymore. Thank you, O Lord, for that fresh start. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, and because we are forgiven by grace through faith in Jesus, we know that the first nanosecond after the last breath, it's heavenly, in paradise, through Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. God's grace and peace be with you. Let us pray. You are, O oh God, indispensable to the health of our globe. You are indispensable to the health of our nation. 
schools, churches, families, marriages. And so for ourselves, with prodding for everyone, we receive you afresh into our lives as Lord and Savior completely for everything. And we thank you, O oh God, that you forgive everything up to this moment and you will forgive things to come that are inevitable because of our humanity that you'll forgive all of it by grace through faith in Jesus so that we become citizens of the heavens your heaven eternal life and that by your grace we make this temporary existence better because where you are Lord everything is better by the example the saving Lordship of Jesus in whose name we pray amen let's stand up and sing together hymn number 656 take time to be holy this hymn is based on the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 14, which says, Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Number 656. continuing God's peace through faith in Jesus. Love God. Be kind to one another. Remember, the answer to every question is Jesus. If you want to stand strong, stand with Jesus. And may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now forever. Amen. Amen.